Good evening, Lighthouse family. So good to be with you tonight uh, for our Wednesday night Bible study. Hope you're having a wonderful week. It's been so beautiful out, uh, and I think the best is yet to come. I understand it's going to uh, get a little bit warmer at the end of the week. We're going to have a, a great and beautiful weekend. I'm sorry I missed you last Sunday, but uh, thank God uh, Cindy did a, a wonderful job, a great message, and Sure did miss being with you in service, but uh, looking forward to this coming Sunday. Let me remind you, talking about the weather, um, uh, our missionary in Guatemala, Nancy Sheldon, I, I texted her just a while ago to uh, tell her that we're praying for her. I don't know if you've been keeping up with the weather, but they're having a really a, almost catastrophic um, hurricane that's going to hit the Central American uh, Peninsula, and Guatemala will be a part of that, and I text Nancy to let her know we're praying for her. She said they're expecting 10 to 20 inches of rain uh, because of that hurricane, and uh, they have a potential. Uh, Guatemala's a very mountainous uh, country, and they have a, a great possibility of mudslides that could cause great damage and, and even uh, death, and so uh, please be in prayer for them for the next few days. It's a slow-moving storm, and so they've got a few days that they're going to have to to deal with this, but pray for them, uh, that whole area, that God would uh, be gracious and merciful and just keep everyone safe during that storm. Well, let's receive our tithes and offerings tonight. If you would, get ready to give. I'm going to pray tonight, and while I do, uh, there are going to be instructions on the screen for how you can give tonight in this service. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' wonderful name, Lord, we are so grateful uh, tonight, God, for the opportunity to Together in Bible study, Lord, I'm always excited about your word, Father, and I'm asking you tonight to speak to your people, uh, everyone that is tuned in with us. I just ask you that you would open the word to them, God, and Lord, you would help us all to understand uh, what you would uh, want us to know tonight, God, from this uh, passage of Scripture. Lord, thank you so much for the Word of God. It is food to our souls, and Lord, we just thank you for all of those hungry people, Lord, that, that tune in week after week, Lord, to hear your Word. We bless them tonight and give you all the praise. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, open them up to the book of Matthew, the ninth chapter. We're going to continue our study in the the book of Matthew, and let me just say tonight, uh, before I get started, I just wanted to uh, mention that, uh, praise God, the elections are over. I thank God uh, that um, we've uh, made it through that. We've done what the Lord has asked us to do. Uh, we've prayed uh, that God would uh, help us to make our selection the right selection. We've prayed that God would bless our nation and uh, that God would raise up the uh, leader that he would have for our nation in, in all aspects, not only on a national level, but in the state and in local government. We, uh, we've been praying and we voted. We've done all that the Lord would ask us to do. And so now I want to encourage us all, we just got to trust the Lord. Uh, with the outcome. We just got to believe that God's will is being done right now. And uh, so it's, it's important and imperative to us that we do our part, though. We, we've still got a part to play. Uh, it, now is not a time to quit praying. Now is a time that we must continue to pray. Because I preached a message, I think it's been probably a few months ago, maybe back in June. Uh, I told you who the most important people on earth are. You remember uh, who the, those people are? Well, we're it. Uh, it's not those people that are in Washington. It's not those that sit in high government places. The most important people on earth is the children of God because we're the friend of God, and God hears our cries. And listen, we are still uh, going to uh, be responsible for the direction that this nation takes uh, in the days and weeks and years to come until the Lord comes back uh, the next time. And so, so we've got a part to play in that. And, and I just want to read a couple of scriptures tonight before we get into our text for the message, just to remind us because it's, it's so very important that we understand what God expects out of us. 1 Timothy 2 verse 1 through 4 says, First of all then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions. We are, we are to continue to pray for our leaders every day. We're to lift them up before God. Why should we do that? That we may uh, lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. 
This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We are to pray so that God would bless this nation first and foremost that His gospel could continue to be preached to all people. God wants to save all people. He wants to save our presidents. He wants to save our senators and our Supreme Court justices and, and all of those people. God desires to save them but He also uh, he, he loves the whole world. And so we're to pray that our nation might experience a level of peace that we could continue to do what God has spoken for us to do. We're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. And can I tell you, light always shines uh, greatest in the greatest darkness. And so we're to continue to be salt and light during these days. Romans 13, 1 says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those those that exist have been instituted by God. Listen, those that exist have been instituted by God. They're in the plan and the purposes of God. God is still in control. Uh, I know election day is over, but God is still on the throne today. And so we need to uh, understand that and, and we need to pray for those who are in authority. Jeremiah 30, 29, 7 says, But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. Listen to this, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. In the welfare of our nation, we will find our own personal welfare. And so we're to pray and we're to be God's light uh, in this dark world. And then one other scripture, Proverbs 21.1, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. God is in authority. God is in control. The president's hand is in the in, uh, heart is in the hand of the Lord. And so, so don't, uh, I don't care if it may not have went, your votes... Uh, uh, your candidate may not uh, be who was elected, but could I tell you, God's got this. And so we've got to trust the Lord, we've got to continue to pray, and we've got to continue to be what God has called us to be, the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So just a little word today at the end of this election season and just uh, pray. Listen, we need, to, we, need to be, uh, we need to be ministers of unity. We don't need to be divisive. We need to bring people together now, and we need to, we need to see this world saved. And so let's continue to do the work of the Lord. Well, uh, turn to Matthew chapter 9, our text tonight. Uh, it's kind of an overlap. I didn't complete the story last time, but I want us to look tonight in Matthew 9, verses 18 through 26. You know, to a child, to a, a teenager, even to a young adult, uh, nothing seems so distant as death. Uh, they, they give little thought to it, and Often uh, young people live quite recklessly, and I don't, I don't, um, I don't uh, uh, accuse them of anything in that because all of us uh, people that are a little bit older, we remember our youth, and and we all lived a little bit recklessly. We all uh, uh, did foolish things when we were growing up because uh, for a young person, death is is for the aged. It, it's not for the young. But, you know, as time progresses and, and the wear and tear of age becomes a reality, so does death in, in, in our own hearts and minds. Instead of never thinking about it, we often think about it. Uh, uh, sometimes we think about it every day, at least I do. I, uh, maybe, maybe you don't, but, but I think about death quite often now. It's, uh, you say, well, that's morbid. Uh, it's not morbid. It's, it's really, I've come to the conclusion, it's really a great blessing in life because uh, for me to consider death, for me to consider that, uh, that my life is, is fading, uh, that, that I'm growing weaker and uh, my vision's not what it once was and, and, and uh, my pace is slowed down, uh, when I, when I think of all of those things, I come to the understanding and I come to the conclusion that, that, that I, I need to consider my ways. I, I need to, uh, uh, considering death prompts me to uh, wonder what I'm leaving behind and to, to worry about my legacy and, uh, and, and to worry about what I'm going to leave in this world after I'm gone. I want to make sure that, that I live a life that, that speaks well of, of God and all that God has done in me. I, uh, I, I think about uh, uh, it prompts me how to get my affairs in order. As you grow uh, older, you want, to, you want to make sure that you leave things uh, in proper order for your family that, that you're leaving behind. It, 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 it prompts you to give more 
more freely. It, it prompts you to love more abundantly. It, it prompts you to live life on a daily basis with a, with a little more intensity and, and to live more in the moment than you do for the future. It seems when we're young, we're always looking uh, out in the future to what's coming. But uh, the older you get, you, you begin to enjoy the moment you live in and try to get all the joy and all the goodness that today has to offer. Uh, uh, death is, is inevitable. We are all going to have to face it. But we don't have to face it with fear. Are you listening to me? We don't have to. I'm not fearful of death. I, I, don't, I don't live in dread that my, my life is, is, is winding down. It, it's not to be feared because we know from the Word of God that Christ has conquered death. Hallelujah. Death has been defeated. The writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus came to destroy him who had the power of death. And because of that, he came to deliver them who through the fear of death are held subject to its bondage. Because can I tell you, if you don't understand that Christ has conquered death, you can live in bondage to death. But listen, death has no more power because Jesus has overcome death. Death looms on our horizon, but, but how marvelous it is to realize that Jesus has conquered it for us. He, the Bible says He has taken the sting out of death. One of my favorite stories that Tony Evans tells, I've, I've heard him tell it on, on numerous occasions. He tells about the two young boys who were coming home from school and they walked by a hedgerow one day and one of the brothers began to, to, to cry out in pain and his younger brother said, oh, what's wrong? What, what's wrong? And his brother looked and said, I, I've been stung. The bee stung me. And then all of a sudden, the younger brother, he started crying and he started screaming and he started waving his hands and his older brother said, why are you screaming? And he said, the bee, the bee's after me. The bee is going to sting me. But the older brother looked at him and said, you don't have to worry because look, he left his stinger in me. And can I tell you, 2,000 years ago, I don't have to fear death because 2,000 years ago, Jesus took the sting of death on Calvary for Raymond Hardy. Hallelujah. And when death comes, death will have no more pain. Death will have no more fear. It has no more power because Jesus has conquered death. Hallelujah. If that's true then, if that's true, if, 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 if the Messiah conquered death, then he should be able to demonstrate power over death. Isn't that right? That's how we know who he said he was. And that's the point that Matthew is making in the 8th and ninth chapter of Matthew that we've been studying. He's been showing through the miracles of Jesus that he was who he said he was, that he was the Messiah and the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who is coming one day to establish a kingdom that will have no end. And in that kingdom, he will have power over all of these things. We've looked in these two chapters. We saw that Jesus had power over disease because he healed all manner of sickness. We saw that he had power over disaster because he was able to even calm the storms. Not only that, he had power over demons. He was able to cast them out of human beings. And now as we come to this latter portion of chapter 9, uh, uh, verses 18 through 35, we're going to find out that Jesus even has power over death. He's the master of disease. He's the master of disaster. He's the master of demons. And now we discover that he's the master even over death. And he's doing that because he's revealing what he, he's the king, he's the Messiah, he's the one who was promised to come, and he's revealing that that's what his kingdom will be through all eternity. Remember Revelation 21.4 says, There will be no death, neither dying, neither any more pain, for all those former things are passed away. That's what God is taking us to. But Jesus gave a preview of coming attractions when he came to earth the first time and he revealed to this world that he was who he said he was. Now in this story that we come to tonight, the story of a young girl that is raised from the dead and a woman healed from the issue of blood, we, we discovered how Jesus worked with people. And, and I began this last time and so in our last study. So let me just take just a few minutes to bring you up to, to par, if you weren't with us, as to where we uh, left this study last time. First of all, we discovered that Jesus was accessible. He was accessible. Jesus was always accessible to people. He was always in the midst of the crowds, answering questions, meeting needs, healing the sick, casting out demons. 
Jesus was where people were. You know, the Bible says that Jesus came uh, incarnate, God with us. Uh, the Scripture says in the Greek that He tabernacled among us. And uh, a tabernacle is a tent. He set up His abode among us. I thought about that this afternoon, that word tabernacle. You remember in the Old Testament, the tabernacle was where God dwelt. He, he, his presence was in the midst of the tabernacle over the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies, over the mercy seat is where God dwelled. And, and Jesus came, the Bible says, and he built his tabernacle among us. You remember the tabernacle in the Old Testament was set in the middle of the people. All of the 12 tribes would set up camp around it and the tabernacle was right in the middle of it. And can I tell you, that's what Jesus did when he came to earth. He came and, and he set up his camp right in the middle of us. And why that is so wonderful is because Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen my Father, which means that he was a manifestation of God himself. And can I tell you, if Jesus was accessible then and he's a manifestation of God, then God is accessible to us today in the same way. He, he dwells in us and he dwells among us and he is accessible. We have access into the very presence of God at any moment. He says, come boldly into the throne of glory. Hallelujah. But not only was Jesus accessible, we also said he was available. In verse 18, it says there came a certain ruler. Uh, if, if you remember the story, Jesus in the, is in the midst of a crowd. Hundreds, if not thousands of people are gathered around him. And out of this crowd, of, uh, out of this multitude, the Bible focuses on one man, a certain ruler. And then if you drop down to verse 20, it says, and behold, a woman. Out of, this, out of this great uh, crowd, Jesus focuses on two people, a ruler and an individual woman. And they come because each of them has a great need. And, 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 and what, I, what I want you to see is that Jesus is not only uh, available uh, or accessible, you, you can not only come to his meeting, but you can get in touch with him personally. Hallelujah. He's, he's available. He's available to those he was available to this father who had a dying daughter. He's available to this woman who's suffering with this severe hemorrhage. And these two things uh, that, that availability uh, involves, these two things that, that brought them into his presence were need and faith. And I want you to remember that. You might want to write that down tonight. Need and faith. If you have great need and you have great faith, can I tell you something? God is always accessible and God is always available to you. You will, you will never be without God if you have great need and if you have great faith. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, it says, cast all your cares upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. Listen, need in faith. Cast all your cares. Bring all of your great needs to God. Bring them, cast them there at his feet because you have faith in him. Cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you. You know, we, we so often feel like we're a, we're a small fish in a, in a great big pond. Uh, I think sometimes we wonder if God even knows where we're at or knows who we are. And certainly we wonder sometimes if God knows what our needs are. Can I tell you, uh, when you have great need, God knows your need. Hallelujah. And if you have need and you will, you will exercise faith, can I tell you, God is on your case and God is moving on your behalf. We had a, just let me just share a little story. We had a, a young lady just a couple of weeks ago uh, in our church that had a great need. Uh, she worked from home, and uh, because of COVID, the company that she worked for was going out of business, and she was just a week or so away from losing her job. The car that she had, she's a single mom, got little children, and, and the car that she had had broken down, and it just wasn't worth trying to repair. It was going to be too costly to repair. And so here she is. She's got a great need. She, she doesn't have a job, and, and, and she needs to be able to go and find work. She needs to be able to transport her children. She, she was hungry to come to church, but didn't have, a, have transportation to get here. And I just noticed she began to, to, to cry out, not, not asking, didn't ask for anything, just, just asked people to pray and, and just shared the need that she had, that she was believing that God was going to provide for her and meet her need in that car. Well, you know, I, as, I, as I saw that, I just couldn't get away from it. It just kind of stuck in my mind and stuck in my heart, and, and I just felt like I needed to do something. 
And, and so I, 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 just, I just was led in a moment just to call somebody because I've done this in the past. I've tried to help people maybe, especially uh, young moms that, that needed transportation to find a, a reliable car and, and, and somebody that had helped me in the past. It was just in my heart and I called that person. And I said, listen, just keep your eyes out for a car. If you find some good, uh, cheap, reliable transportation, let me know. Well, that person called me back in about 30 minutes and, and said, listen, Pastor, my mom today, are you listening to me? My mom today just bought a brand new car, and she's got this, this uh, vehicle. She's had it a long time, but it's only got 50,000 miles. It, it needs a little bit of work. There's something going on with it, but, but uh, maybe she would be willing to sell that. Uh, to this person and I said well ask her and, and we'll see what we can do he called me back just a few minutes later and he said I talked to her and she'll let her have it and I said well how much does she want and, and he said she doesn't want anything she wants to give that car to that person and so we went and got it and we took it and, and it could have been a very costly repair and we just left it with the person. They called us back in a few days. It cost $300 to get that vehicle repaired and we took it and we gave it to that young mom and I'm telling you how, how blessed she was. But listen to me, listen to me. Uh, you, you know why she received what she got? Because she had a great need and she had a great faith that God could supply her need. And can I tell you, God is, God is on your case when you have need and when you have faith. Now, I can't, listen, this will help somebody. You know, I, I'm a pastor and I'm surrounded by needs. We get needs every day of the week. People call in and they have needs and, and all needs are important. But you know, I can't meet every need and this church can't meet every need. The needs are too great to meet every, you know what needs that I, I try to meet? I try to meet the needs that the Lord lays in my heart to, need, to meet. Why? Because God is using me, amen, to be a part of meeting that need. You don't have to save the world. You just got to be obedient to God and do what He would have you to do in whatever situation He would speak to your heart. If you'll be obedient, God will work miracles through your life. Hallelujah. I, that's not my message, but, but I just wanted to add that in. Listen, God is, is available. Not only is He accessible, not only is He available, but thirdly, I love this, Jesus was also touchable. He was touchable. Verse 19, he arose and followed him, and so did the disciples. Let me, let me just kind of bring you up to, to speed if you haven't uh, already spent a few moments reading this text tonight. Jesus has been ministering to the disciples of John. He's been talking to the Pharisees. And in the middle of his conversation, this ruler comes, the ruler of the synagogue comes, and says, Jesus, my daughter is, is dying. She wasn't dead, as Matthew says. Uh, the, other, uh, the other accounts uh, say that she was dying. Dying. She was in the midst, very sick on, on, the, on her deathbed, but she was not dead yet. And he, he, he wanted Jesus to come because he had faith that, that he was able to do what nobody else could do for his sick daughter. The Bible says Jesus said, okay, I'll go. He arose up and followed him. The scripture says, and so did his disciples. But if you go to, to Luke and Mark's account, and they said, and so did the whole crowd. So you've got this mass of people, hundreds if not uh, maybe a few thousand people that are following Jesus and they're winding their way down these narrow streets of this city going to this ruler's house because his daughter is sick. And then verse 20 says, Behold, a woman who had been diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him. She, she had an issue of blood. Here comes a, a woman. She's, uh, the crowd is walking and Jesus is following this ruler. And, and I want you to see this. And here this woman is and, and she's, she's pressing her way through this crowd. She's, she sees Jesus and she's got something in her heart that she needs to do. And she has a great need. Uh, she, she has an issue of blood, and in, under the Levitical law, uh, this issue of blood rendered her unclean. Her person was unclean. The, the Bible says the bed that she laid on was unclean. If she sat on a stool, it was unclean. The clothes that she wore was unclean. And anybody that touched her was unclean. And you know what uncleanliness, the worst thing about being unclean was, is it separated you from the people of God. It separated you from the sanctuary. You couldn't go into the temple if you were unclean. You couldn't touch people if you were unclean. It probably rendered her isolated. Uh, her husband probably divorced her. Her family uh, would have nothing to do with her because she was perpetually unclean for 12 years. I want you to see that. And, and, and she's heard about Jesus, and she's got this desperate need. 
Remember what I told you, uh, what makes you available to God? You have a great need and you have a great faith. She has a great need and she's heard that Jesus is a miracle worker. She's heard the proclamation of who he said he was and a faith has risen up within her. In verse 21 uh, says, uh, literally it says in the Greek, she kept saying this over and over to herself. She didn't say it one time. Over and over to herself, she said, if I can just touch his garment, I'll be well. If I can just get to him, if I can just touch him, I know I'll be well. And as Jesus moved through this crowd, can you see it? His disciples around him, the crowd pressing in on him. She looked and, and she could see the little tassel on the hem of his garment. The, 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 the Jews would wear four tassels. They would hang down as a, a, a symbol, uh, symbolizing the word of God over their lives. And they would hang down from their robe. And she saw this just dangling and she said, if I can just get to it, if I can just touch that tassel, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made well. And she finally presses her way through. She, she pushes and she shoves and she pulls people apart until she finally lunges and she grabs the hem of his garment. In verse 22, Jesus turned around and he saw her and he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee well. The woman was made well from that hour. He responded. Listen, he responded to her touch because Jesus is touchable. Hallelujah. He's touchable. Uh, one, of the, one of the great things of, 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 of uh, Christianity is, is the touch of God. If you've ever been touched by God, you, you, you will never forget it. There, there's something about it. I mean, there, there, is a, there is a literal touch that, that, that can almost be felt physically uh, when God reaches down and, and touches us. And, and he does that in response to us reaching out to him in faith. He, he, he was touchable. He was sensitive. He was responsible, responsive to this woman's need. She, you know she's embarrassed. She know, she's not to be in this crowd. She, she was rendering all of those that she touched unclean. But, but she got to the place that she, all, she knew that, that, that something would never change unless she could touch him because he had power. And, 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 and maybe her motive was somewhat uh, uh, impure. Maybe it wasn't, maybe it wasn't the faith that, that we, would, uh, we would describe that Jesus would respond to. You know, I, it almost seems that, that she's more fixated on the hem of his garment than she is on him. And, uh, but, but she has faith. She, she believes the report in who he says he is. And, 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 and she just sees that little tassel. And maybe, maybe it's almost like a dangling rabbit's foot that if she can just touch it, it'll, it'll, it'll be, all be better. You know, the, the, the uh, motives of that ruler were, were not uh, probably as pure as we would think his faith would be. Uh, he, he was desperate. His daughter was uh, dying and he knew nobody else could help her. But he believed. I want you to see that. He had faith. He believed that this man was who he said he was because he had heard and seen the things that he had done. But what I love about Jesus is Jesus took them where they were. He took the, that, just that little mustard seed of faith and he brought them to redemption. Now, now listen to me just for, for a moment. Because when we read this story, we get, we, get so, we get so fixated upon the healing. We get so, we get so uh, our minds get so fixed upon the raising of this young girl from the dead. But can I tell you, that's really not the story here. Those are parts of the story and they're grand and they're wonderful. But, but that's not the real story. The real story is, 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 is something I want to show you. It's not found in Matthew's account of this story. It's found in, in Luke's account of the story. And so if you have your Bibles and you want to flip over to Luke, the 8th chapter, Luke records something that Matthew doesn't about this story, and I want you to see it. In Luke 8, verse 44, it says, And when she, this woman with the issue of blood, came behind and touched the border of his garment, watch this, immediately, the issue of blood staunched or, or stopped. It was over. Let me ask you a question. When was this woman healed? Think about it. When was she healed? The scripture, the scripture says immediately when she touched him, she was healed. It, was, it, it, it didn't happen in an in a hour. It didn't happen in, in minutes. It happened immediately when she touched the hem of his garment. The bleeding stopped. 
And I love this. Watch this now. And Jesus said, who grabbed me or who touched me? Well, everybody obviously denied it. And Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude, the crowd, uh, that the multitude crowd thee and press thee and sayest thou, who touched me? In other words, Lord, you got to be kidding. Uh, uh, th- this crowd is, is pressing against you. They're jostling you. They're, they're, they're pushing you. And, and you want to know who touched you? But Jesus, listen, Jesus knew the difference between someone just being brushing up against him, someone, someone who, uh, who uh, 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 was, was jostled and pushed up against him. He understood the difference between that and the grasping of a hurting, needful soul. There was a difference there. He said, who touched me? And I love this, verse 46, Jesus said, Somebody has touched me, for I perceive that power, listen to me, that power is gone out of me. What what an incredible statement. Jesus says, uh, I, I don't know, Jesus didn't know. Literally, he did not know who had touched him at the moment. He only knew that somebody had touched him with such faith that the power, the anointing that was upon his life had, had left, had went out of him. Someone had received from him and he didn't even know who it was. You know what that tells me? I love this story. You know what that tells me? Jesus was such a channel for the, for the will of the Father. And isn't that what he said? He said, I've only come. I have not come to do my own will. I've come to do the will of he who sent me. Jesus lived to do the will of God. And can I tell you, Jesus was such a conduit for the power of God, for the will of God, that God was able to use him. And he, he had no part in this miracle. He, he didn't turn. He didn't say anything to her. God healed this woman. God sovereignly healed this woman. And he touched her through the Son of God. Amen. He touched her through his, 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 his body, and he didn't even know who it was. I've came to do the will of him that sent me. You know, I believe that God does the very same thing through us. I want you to think about that for a moment. For those people who who live in the anointing of God, for those people who love God and and, and who are available for the will of God to, uh, to flow through their lives, can I tell you, I believe God does that in us. I believe God touches people through our lives sometimes and we don't even know the extent that God is using us but because we're available and because the anointing is upon our lives, God can flow out of our lives and into somebody else. Hallelujah. I believe sometimes through a word that we say or an action that we do that God can flow out of our lives, that that someone can receive what they need from God in a moment because we were available and God was able to flow through our lives. You ever, you ever listen? Listen. You ever, you ever listen to a preacher on television? You ever, you ever read a Christian book and God used that person? They don't even know you're watching. They don't even, I don't know, I don't know who's watching tonight, but maybe the very words that I'm speaking, God is using me tonight and God is flowing, that power is flowing into you tonight because because God is sovereign and God can use people. Hallelujah. I, sometimes when I'm preaching, you've, you've heard me say this I, to people that are in the congregation or maybe to someone that's watching. I, 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 I have so literally, uh, I, it must have been somehow what Jesus felt. I say, I just feel God right now touching somebody. I just feel God right now speaking to somebody because it's almost tangible. You can, you can feel the power being released. Hallelujah. I don't know if I'm explaining that well. But, but God, God used even His Son, and, and Jesus at the moment didn't even know that God was doing it through Him. He just simply felt the power go because He was touchable. He was sensitive to the one who reached out and touched the hem of His garment. Not only was He accessible, not only was He available, not only was He touchable, but, but I love this about Jesus, He was impartial. When he turned around uh, to get involved with this this young woman, uh, he showed that he was impartial. Listen, Jesus Jesus was on a mission. Jesus was headed somewhere. Where was Jesus headed at this moment? We've been talking about it. Where was he headed? He was headed to the ruler of the synagogue of this city. 
I'm talking about one of the highest officials in, in the city of Capernaum. He's on a mission to go to this man's house and to touch and to, and to heal his daughter. And, and this man was, I, I'm sure this ruler was very antsy. He was, he was ready for Jesus to get there. He was probably walking very fast or maybe even running as he, as he went towards his home because he wanted the Lord to get there. His daughter is dying. And yet Jesus is, is, is impartial because, because she reaches out and touches Him and Jesus just stops everything. He feels the power of God released and, 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 and He turns around. And, and you, you would have thought maybe in our day, uh, somebody would have said, look lady, let go of my, let go of my, my robe. Look, look I'm, on a, I'm on a mission. This, this man is a ruler over this city. This, this guy, is he's somebody in this city. And if, if I can go and minister to him, maybe, maybe he'll bring revival to this entire city because he's really somebody. Jesus didn't say that. He, 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 didn't, he didn't push her away. No, God, God never looks for superstars. God is never impressed with bright lights. He, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, g come simply for famous people. He loves everybody, and, and he'll come to kings and peasants alike. But, but he's always, he's always, uh, he's always been with folk like us. Hallelujah. He's always been with, with little people. That, Jesus said, or Isaiah said, that when the Messiah come, he would come to preach the gospel to who? The Bible says he came to preach it to the poor. Paul wrote, not many noble and not many mighty, but he's chosen the base and the weak and the ignoble and the foolish thing. I mean, the Bible's full of, of a motley crew of people that, that God came to, to save and to seek and to heal and to love. The Bible is full of prostitutes and murderers and drunkards and adulterers and liars and thieves. It's, it's full of that and, and, and such were some of you. The Bible says that God is what? He's no respecter of what? Of people. Young and old, rich and poor, male and female, Jew or Greek, bond or free, all are one in Him. And so Jesus comes to this woman and, and He pulls everything to a halt. And He deals with her. He doesn't deal with her at a distance because she's unclean. Remember, He's touchable. He, he's, he, he's, he's, you can reach out and, 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 and he, he, he says something beautiful to this woman. Watch what he calls her in verse 22. He calls her daughter. He didn't turn around and say woman. He, he uses a very uh, uh, intimate, a very personal um, word. He says, daughter, your faith has made you well. And the woman was well from that hour. Hallelujah. He's impartial. Now, now, listen to this and, and follow, follow me for just a moment because I really want you to see this. Now, now, Jesus turns and He says, Your faith has made you well, and the woman was well from that hour. Now, that is Matthew's account, but remember we looked at Luke's account uh, a little bit earlier. And really, I just challenge you, if you really want to get the full extent of this story, uh, go to Mark and go to Luke and go to Matthew and, and read their account simultaneously and, and, and you'll, you'll get a, a more clear picture of what is happening here. But, but, but he turns to her. You'll also find out that he said, who, who touched me? And he didn't know immediately, but, but finally she comes forth and, and presents herself. And, and, and so, so this isn't happening um, in, in, in uh, the condensed version that Matthew gives us. It's a little more prolonged. He didn't know who touched her. And, 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 but then when he does, he, he says, Daughter, be of good comfort. Your faith has made you well, and the woman was well from that hour. Now. Now, watch this. Isn't she already well? Isn't she already healed? Remember, remember, I told you uh, in Luke's account, the Bible says as soon as she touched the hem of her gar his garment, immediately she was made whole. But now Jesus comes along and says, Your faith has made you well, and the woman was well from that hour. This, listen, this is an addition to that. And this is the part of the story that I think we, we sometimes miss, but this is the most beautiful part. This is, this is the most important part of, of, of the whole story. It wasn't that God healed her physically. Thank God for that. He did that, though, the minute she touched Him. 
But here's something else. Because, because your healing, he says, didn't have anything to do with your faith. Listen, she didn't get healed because of her faith. She got healed by the sovereignty of God. God looked down and when she touched, remember Jesus didn't even say a word. He had no part in this miracle. It was a sovereign act of God. When she touched the hem of His garment, immediately God healed her. But that wasn't, that wasn't why her faith was so important. Remember, her faith was somewhat skewed. It was, it was probably somewhat superstitious. She was more fixated on his garment than she was on him. Where was her faith? Her faith was in that he was who he said he was. That's what brought her to the place to start with. Now watch this. In addition to her physical healing, he says, your faith has. And the word that he uses there, uh, 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 the word that he didn't use was, was I know my, which uh, means to be made well physically. But he used the word sozo. And in the New Testament, the word sozo is the, is the word for salvation, the word to be saved. And so when, he, when, when she presented herself, he said, your faith has saved you. And she was saved from that hour. Yes, there was a sense in which she was saved physically. She was saved from her disease. But can I tell you, more importantly, she was saved. Are you listening to me? More importantly, she was saved spiritually. She was born again. Why? Because she had faith that He was who He said He was. That's what brings salvation. She believed in who He was. You remember the story in the Bible of the ten lepers? You remember they came to Jesus and Jesus told them to go and present themselves unto the priest and they went and the Bible says as they went, it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Nine of them, ten of them were cleansed. The word that is used there is the word for washed or cleansed. It, it means they were touched and cleansed physically. They were healed of their leprosy. But watch this. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, physically, turned around and with a loud voice glorified God. Fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering him said, Were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God except this stranger. There was one that came back. And what did Jesus say to this one? All ten of them were healed sovereignly by God. They came, and, and I don't know that all ten of them had faith because can I tell you something about healing? Sometimes God heals just because He wants to heal. I know that, that there's some won't agree with that. They believe that God only heals because of faith, but can I tell you the Bible's full. Sometimes Jesus healed them all. And I can tell you, when Jesus healed them all, there were some in the crowd that didn't have faith. God sometimes heals. God sometimes heals an unbeliever. Listen, God raises the dead, and you can't tell me the dead have faith. God didn't heal the dead. God didn't raise the dead because they had faith. Sometimes God sovereignly, listen to me, sometimes God sovereignly will heal a sick body without faith. But can I tell you, God never saves anybody except by faith. Nobody has ever come into the kingdom except they had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And these, this, that of the ten, nine of them went on their way. They were healed physically, but this one came back. And we'll watch what Jesus said. Arise, go thy way. Same phrase, thy faith hath saved thee. The word is sozo there. Thy faith has brought you salvation. There was a cleansing of the ten, but there was a saving of the one because God, sometimes God does honor. Listen, I, I believe sometimes God does honor faith in healing, but can I tell you, God always honors faith in salvation. Hallelujah. I don't want you to miss this in this story because I believe this ruler and I believe this woman, they got what they wanted in the natural realm, but can I tell you, they got so much more in the supernatural because they both had a great need, but they also had great faith. They believed in Jesus as the Son of God. Jesus loves people. He was accessible. He was available. He was touchable. He was impartial. And then I want you to see, lastly, He was powerful. Jesus was powerful. Now, now I can be the first four. Are you listening to me? I can, be, I can be accessible. I can be available. I can be touchable. I can be impartial. But can I tell you, I cannot be powerful. If you're sick, I can't heal you. If you've got sin, I can't forgive you. 
If you're dead, I can't raise you. Only God can do that. Hallelujah. This is what sets him apart from everybody else. He, he has all power. So note verse 33. And Jesus came to the ruler's house. Now, now again, if you bring all the accounts together, you, you find out this little girl is sick. She's, she's close to death, but she's not dead. But Jesus, in his trying to get to the ruler's house, he's got this interruption. The woman stops the crowd, and he, he deals with this woman with the issue of blood. And by the time Jesus finally gets there, the little girl has died. She's, she's already passed. And, and uh, it says, he came, when he came to the house, he saw the musicians and the people making a noise. Now, now the funeral started because funerals happened very quickly in this time. They, they buried people very quickly. They didn't have modern forms of embalming and, and they buried people often within 24 hours of their death. And so as soon as the, the person died, the, the funeral would begin. And now he comes and, and these people are, there's musicians and the people are making a racket. And, and that just doesn't compute with us because when someone dies now and and you've been to a funeral home. When you go to the funeral home, you walk in and it's quiet. and There's gentle music just playing very, very lightly. And you walk down these, these broad halls into these, these little rooms and people are just in little gatherings and they're speaking quietly. And, 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 and uh, there, there's not much, not much noise. Maybe someone's weeping. Maybe someone's a little louder. But for the most part, our culture is quiet. But their culture was anything but that. It was noisy. These people were making a bunch of noise. Now, now, now let me just explain a Jewish funeral real quickly. Just three things about it uh, 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 that, 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 that'll help you to kind of get a picture of what's going on. First of all, there was the, the rending of garments. When, when someone died, you were supposed to rip your clothes. I know that doesn't make sense to us today. It doesn't make sense to me now, just thinking about it. But, but they, would, they would rend their garments. And in the Talmud, there were 39 different rules and regulations on exactly how you were supposed to, to rip your clothes. You were, you were supposed to be standing up when you ripped them, and you were supposed to rip them over the area of your heart. You were supposed to rip it uh, broad enough so that a fist could go through it. A woman, of course, couldn't rip uh, the garment in a, in a way that would expose, so she would often rip her undergarment uh, that was under her robe and, and, and open it up. When uh, you uh, ripped your garment, it was to stay open for seven days. And when you did repair it for the first 30 days, you were to repair it with large stitches. It wasn't like you would normally repair a garment that was ripped. You would use large stitches. Why? So that when someone saw you, they could see that you were still in mourning. They were all of these regulations. And so, so you, you, you got to see Jesus walks into this and people are, people are ripping their clothes. And there's, listen, this is a, this is a very well known man. This is, the leader of the synagogue. So, so there, maybe the whole town would have been there at this man's house, it, uh, a very big funeral. The second thing, there was wailing. They, uh, they would wail, and, and uh, it wasn't the, the people's family. You would hire professional wailers, professional mourners. There would people come in and they would literally shriek and they would scream and they would cry out. Uh, you, if you've been to a funeral, sometimes uh, you, you'll go into a funeral situation and it's, it's, it's heart-rending. Someone is just so overcome by grief that they weep and they wail. Well, that's, that's literally what these, these paid mourners would do, but they were actors. They were, they were being paid to do this, to, to put on a performance and to show their, the mourning. The third thing they were to do were, were uh, uh, to have musicians, flute players. They, they had all different kind of flutes, and they would bring them in. And, and under Israelite, again, under uh, uh, Israelite uh, requirements, you were to have a certain number. If you were very poor, you had to have at least two flute players and one whaler. You know, funerals are expensive today. They, I guess they've always been. You, even if you couldn't afford it, you, uh, just to meet the, 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 the standard of the day, you, if you were poor, you would have one, uh, two flute players and one mourner. But if you were a person of wealth, you would, you would uh, uh, multiply that depending on the, the value. And so this man was, was very well known, probably very wealthy. And so, so he's got all, many mourners. There's people shrieking. They're crying. They're wailing. you got people playing 
flutes. You got people uh, tearing their clothes. And, and, and Jesus, this is what he walks into. But watch what he says in verse 24. And he said to them, go away. He walks into this house and, and, and he says to them, go away. And they say, what do you mean go away? This, this is acceptable. This is, this is appropriate. This is, this is what we're supposed to do. This girl is dead, and, and, and this, is, this is what the Talmud requires us to do. But Jesus says go away, and, and what is his reason? He says the girl is not dead. She's sleeping. Huh. You know what the Bible says they did? Verse 24, they laughed in his face. So what, what are you talking about? Haven't you heard? Can't you, can't you see for yourself? This girl is dead. Jesus said, no, she's, she's not a dead. You, you can't treat this. You, go away because you're, you're acting like she's dead, but she's not dead. She's only asleep. Why? Because Jesus knew what he was going to do. He was going to raise her from the dead. That, that'll tell you a little bit about uh, how good actors these people were. They're wailing at one moment and now they're, now they're laughing in Jesus' face. But, but they, were, they, were, they were there and, and, and the, the Scripture actually says they, they laughed if someone would laugh over someone who's stupid. They, they, this was insane. What do you mean she's not dead? And they laughed him to scorn. Only a fool would think he could raise her from the dead. The problem is, is they've, this is Capernaum. This is a city where Jesus has done many miracles. And they've, many of these same people have seen His miracles. But it's one thing to heal the sick. It's one thing to cast out a devil. It's one thing even to calm a storm. But to say that you can bring somebody back to life that's already dead and they laughed and Jesus said, listen, go away. Verse 25, but when the people were put forth, He got rid of them. He went in and took her by the hand. The other gospel records say that he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, arise. He took her by the hand and the girl arose. And Luke again in his account in, in Luke 8, he adds an important word to this. He says, and her spirit came again. In other words, she was dead. She wasn't, she wasn't just unconscious. She wasn't just in, in some, uh, uh, some uh, unconscious state. She was literally dead. Her spirit had already left her. But when Jesus uh, took her by the hand and lifted her up. Her spirit came again. You know, Jesus, I thought about that. Jesus didn't have to, he didn't have to take her by the hand. He could have simply spoken, but, but that's the way Jesus is. Jesus is a, he's a tender Savior. He's a gentle Savior. He's a merciful and a compassionate and a loving Savior. And I tell you what, when, when Jesus ever ministers to me, he always, he always does so in a, in a wonderful touch. I don't know how to explain that. I don't know how to make you understand of the touch of God. But if you've ever experienced it, if you've ever felt it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And he reached down and he grabbed her affectionately by the hand and lifted her up. And verse 26 says, And the fame of this went abroad into all the land. And you know what they said about him? Now we know he has power over disease. We know he has power over disaster. We know He has power even over demons, but let me tell you the greatest thing. He has power over death. He has power over death. And, and, and so He is the one. He, he, he presented Himself. And He did everything that only God could do. He forgave sin and He even raised the dead. Listen, we don't have to fear death. We, we have no need to fear it at all. Death no longer should be our enemy. Death should be our friend. Death should be a realization that, that through that process, God gains total and complete victory. Hallelujah. Over our lives. We don't have to fear a passing from this life to the next. I know it's unknown and, 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 and it seems so maybe strange to us, but can I tell you, when you understand and you believe that Jesus has the power of death, I fully believe that the moment I close my eyes and breathe my last breath, I don't believe there'll be no dark tunnel that I have to pass through. I believe in the very moment that, that I breathe my last breath, Jesus will reach down like He did to this little girl and take me by the hand and lead me into His presence where I'll live forever and ever and ever. Because He is the King that He said He was. He was the Messiah. He was the one 
He's the soon coming king and he will establish a, a throne and sit in his kingdom forever and ever and he'll have all power over death. He'll have all power over disaster. He'll have all power over demons. He'll have all power over death. And what a wonderful place that will be. Someone once painted a picture. I saw this many years ago. I wish I, wish I had written down the author or, or, or uh, written down the name of it. I tried to find it uh, on the internet, but I couldn't. But such a, such a beautiful picture. Someone tried to portray death, and, and they did so by painting a picture of, uh, of a group of caterpillars. And these caterpillars are dressed in their finest black suits, and on their back as they're weeping and crying and walking down the road, they've got a, they've got a, a, a bear on their back, and they're carrying the cocoon of one of the caterpillars on their back. And they're crying and they're weeping and they're so sad. But if you look up in the picture, over, over above them, flying uh, gently above, is the most beautiful butterfly. And it's as if he's looking down in amazement at those that are weeping and crying because he's been released from his cocoon. He's taken on a much grander life. One day, listen, one day, one day, one day, one day, we'll leave this world. We won't have to crawl around. That, 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 uh, that caterpillar spends his whole life crawling around in the dirt, but one day God will release us to fly into his glory. We will live with him in a beautiful body that he's given us, a body like unto our Lord's glorious body. and We will live with him forever and forever. What a, what a wonderful day that will be. You don't have to fear death. Death has no power. It has no victory over us. Death has already been defeated. The author of death has been defeated. Jesus has taken back the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And praise God, he, he rules over it today in the lives of all of those who put their trust in Him. I'm so grateful today for this ruler. I'm so grateful for this woman with the issue of blood. Thank God for the, for the temporary healing that they received, the temporary relief that they received in this life. But thank God they received uh, everlasting, eternal life because they had not only a great need, but they had a great faith in God. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you tonight for your word, God. I thank you for the great and exceeding and blessed promises of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That, Lord, you have power in this life, but more importantly, God, you have power in the life to come. And, Lord God, we don't have to fear that transition from this life to the next, because Jesus has defeated death for us. God, if there's anybody listening to me tonight that lives under the fear of death, God, they live under the bondage, God, that it brings, I pray tonight, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that, Lord, not only would their great, they have a great need, God, they have a great need, they, they need you more than they need life itself. But, God, I pray that they would reach out with a hand of faith, maybe, just maybe tonight, God. Lord, uh, uh, you've spoken through me, Lord, in a way that has released your power into their heart. And God, they would reach out by faith and touch the hem of your garment and say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, be my Lord and be my Savior. If they'll do that, Lord, you will, uh, God, redeem them, Father. And Lord, you'll, you'll deliver them tonight from that fear, God. We praise you, God. We thank you. We give you glory. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. God bless you, church. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed God's Word. Go out and share the good news with somebody. Amen. Go out, be light, be salt in the midst of a world right now that needs you more than ever before. We love you. Look forward to seeing you Sunday morning. God bless you.